universities of Nottingham, Cambridge and Huddersfield. He completed his doctoral thesis on mid-15th century English mass cycles in continental sources in 2014, supervised by Peter Wright and Philip Weller, and examined by John Caldwell and John Morhen. He works on 15th century English music with a particular focus on cultural exchange between England and Europe. He also recently co-founded a new international research group called Representations of Early Music on Stage and Screen, and that is at the University of Nottingham. So welcome, James, and you are, well, I shouldn't be welcoming you, but welcome to <laughs> the podium, so to speak. And James will address the subject of three voice textures in the mid-15th century English mass cycle. Thank you. I've just realised for the broadcast that we have going out over the web, the entirety of my presentation is in mirror writing. Um, so I apologise to all of you watching online. <laughs> it does flip it. Oh, okay, it isn't. I don't apologise to you anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, my purpose today is to offer uh, some slight revisions to the current typology of textures in three voice English mass cycles of around the mid 15th century. I will be drawing on Andrew Kirkman's comprehensive work on voice ranges and Margaret Bent's work on grammatical function as well as making some refinements based on analysis of the nature of pre-existent material found within certain works. This slightly revised type, uh, typology, though far from complete, offers new perspectives on some apparently unusual mass cycles that appear to sit outside of the norms, perspectives which might shed light on issues of authorship, provenance and chronology. The handling of three voice textures is something which seemingly went through a period of dramatic change in the 15th century. Andrew Kirkman's survey of the development of the contratenor bassus in the later century has dealt comprehensively with one aspect of this. His work has already identified two major paradigms uh, within the English three-voice mass cycle repertory in the years before 1470. One of these, exemplified by masses such as Plumber's sine nomine, is a clear continuation of the discant style, which gives an exceptionally stratified structure consisting of a low tenor, middle voice contratenor, and a discantus. In many cases, this is written with a lower cleft tenor, but there are further examples, <coughs> such as the two Kyrie's mass, which keep a remarkably stratified texture, despite the lower two voices sharing a cleft. Interestingly, this seems to reverse the role and range of tenor and counter in the texture of discant works in sources such as Old Hall, a style which could be seen to prefigure the low contratenor found from around 1470, but with a completely different function for the lower voice. The second paradigm, similarly involves masses with lower voices cleft identically, but with a more wide-ranging contratenor, which can alternate between being the lowest and the middle voice. Kirkman notes that this particular disposition seems to be more common in works from earlier in the century, citing Foot Homo Mises as a good example. However, far from being a chronological distinction, it's my, my contention um, that it's born out of the presence and nature of pre-existent material. A comparison of mass cycles with tenors based on pre-existent material and those more freely composed is particularly illuminating and, I think, serves to help us tighten our typology. However, before we begin, it's worth making a brief note on voice <coughs> nomenclature and function. As Margaret Bent has noted, the third voice of a three-voice work is not necessarily a contratenor, but may instead be a second cantus. This is precisely the case with Fuit Homo Mises, and something which we must keep in mind throughout the discussion. Is it possible that the wide-ranging third voice is only present since it is a second cantus rather than a contratenor, or is this voice type itself something which is linked to chronology or provenance? So to begin with the cantus firmus mass repertory, other than an important group of masses with a third voice cleft lower than the tenor, almost all English cantus firmus mass cycles from this period have equally cleft lower voices. Despite this, some are seemingly highly stratified with others um, having overlapping ranges. A brief survey of two examples, uh, one fruit homomesis, which is particularly stratified, and the other quemalignus spiritus with frequent voice crossing demonstrates precisely on what these differences seem to rest. Quemalignus spiritus has been chosen as an example which, like fruit homomesis, uses a second cantus rather than a contratenor to demonstrate that it's not necessarily the presence of a second cantus which creates the apparently wide-ranging third voice. Fruit homomesis. This analysis rests on a consideration of the plain chant on which each mass is based. We will begin with Foot Homo Missus. Uh, the melody begins very low in the tessitura, moving between C and G. This then shifts far higher, uh, F to D, around the syllable mis and the syllable, uh, at the syllable yo, 
it again explores the lower end of the ranges before returning to the higher tessitura from the syllable hic until the end. These changes in tessitura com correspond well to the sections within which the tenor and second cantus change range. A comparison of example 2a, um, which is here, um, which is bars 33 to 37 of the Kyrie, uh, which is the end of the melisma on the syllable mo, so there, uh, with 2b, the following slide here, uh, demonstrates this. When the tenor explores the higher limits of its range, it generally rests above the second cantus, but when lower in the range, it rests below it. A comparison with Quem Malignus Spiritus demonstrates precisely why this cycle has a second cantus that generally rests above the tenor. This particular chant is rather more mobile than Thuit Homomesis, exploring a wider range more consistently, rather than resting at either extreme of its tessitura for relatively long periods of time. The plain chant does not fully explore the upper reaches of its range until the word preche. It is around this section only, specifically where the chant reaches its absolute upper range, that the second cantus briefly reaches below the tenor and both change range in the polyphonic mass. A comparison of bars 91 to 96 of the Kyrie with 163 to 6 illustrates this. As you can see there. Unlike the homo, uh, Fuit Homo Mises chant, which generally sticks to each extreme of its range for, periods of, for long periods of time, periods of time that correspond to the tenor alternating range with the second cantus in the polyphonic mass, Quem Malignus generally keeps low in its range, occasionally extending it by a single tone or semitone. When the chant finally reaches a full articulation of the highest extreme of the chant's range, only here do the second cantus and tenor briefly swap ranges in the polyphonic mass. This exact same paradigm can be found in English mass cycles with more traditional contratenor parts, such as the anonymous paratime nobis, where the range of the two lower voices again largely seems to react to the changes in the tessitura of the chant. Of course, it would be erroneous to suggest that composers have no control over the range of a cantus firmus, since they could choose to transpose the plain chant or use extensive paraphrase. The desired registral and textural features of the mass may also have been taken into account when choosing the cantus firmus in the first place, alongside the obvious liturgical or intertextual con uh, considerations. This seems to be an element of pre-compositional rather than compositional choice, however. It seems that, by and large in this period, the third voice of a cantus firmus cycle, be it a second cantus or a contratenor, it's cleft equally with the, with the tenor, generally remaining as the middle voice in the texture, apart from when the tenor reaches the highest points of its charm range. Any apparent difference in the range of the third voices in these mass cycles seems not to be indicative of any real difference in compositional process due to the difference in chronology or provenance, or the grammatical function of the third voice, but rather a difference in the nature of its borrowed charm. Uh, obviously, this is quite se seemingly quite different for the masses uh, with low, lower cleft contratenors, which I'm going on to now. There are three English mass cycles from this period uh, with Cantus Fermi, which have a third voice cleft lower than the tenor. Two of these are by Walter Fry and are found in the Brussels Choir Book, whilst the other, Veni Creata Spiritus, is anonymous and found in the Strahov manuscript. I wish to begin my discussion with Veni Creata Spiritus, uh, since it seems somewhat unrelated to the two Fry examples. This is an extremely problematic cycle in almost every regard. Um, it's one of a group of mass cycles with features that seemingly rule out either English or continental origin, and which therefore seem most likely to have been produced <coughs> through some sort of process of cultural exchange between the two regions. For some time, my opinion has vacillated between whether Veni Creata Spiritus was an English mass cycle showing a degree of continental influence, or an otherwise unknown example of local continental right, which allowed for the use of what I've described as a curtailed prosula curiae. Uh, so it has a prosula text, uh, but only some of the invocations. Uh, Kirkman, the last scholar to have discussed this cycle in detail, agrees that whilst it contains a number of features typical of insular music, its place of origin remains unclear. It's now my belief that an understanding of this mass's texture might help to answer this question a little bit more fully. Perhaps the most unusual element for a supposedly uh, English mass cycle over this time is the presence of the cantus firmus in the upper voice. This occurs in no other English mass cycle of the mid-century. The two lower voices are also apparently unique. The precise configuration of clefts, which is C1, C2, C5, which we have here, is found nowhere else in Kirkman's study, and the closest analogies are found in four continental masses from post-1475, which have the clefting of C2, C3, F4, all of which seem to be noted with Bassus as the name of the lower voice. 
This somewhat unusual distribution and function <coughs> of the voices appears to have confused the scribe of Strahov just as much as it's confused subsequent scholars. The initial indication of voice names swaps the tenor and contratenor, as you can see there. At the start of the mass, all three voices are assigned, assigned to the same folio, um, which carries the music of the first Kyrie section. The verso of this folio carries the upper voice for the Christe and Kyrie II and the tenor of the Christe, this time correctly named, but for some reason carrying the clef of the upper voice, <coughs> which makes all of the pitches out by a third. On the following recto are found the tenor of the second Kyrie and the Christe and Kyrie II uh, of the contratenor. This unusual voice distribution is continued across almost all of the openings of the Mass, eschewing the usual format almost entirely and generally attempting to place all three voices of a section on the same page where possible. Occurring as it does in the first layer of Strahov, uh, copied around 1462 to 1465, this Mass would seem to be a little ahead of the curve in terms of having a lower third voice. Of course, as noted above, the rise of the lower third voice is not something entirely new, and the closest parallel for the range and function of the lower voice in Venecreata Spiritus may well be the discount tradition found in Old Hall, um, though the comparison is far from exact. These works, whilst often carrying the cantus firmus in the tenor, do have several examples, such as uh, Credo, the number 57, uh, with it in the upper voice. The most usual clefing, C1, C3, C5, is very close to that of Venecreata. Furthermore, the function of the contratenor in Venecreata seems far closer to that of a counter, such as those found in Old Hall 2, at least at the start of each movement. Um, a direct comparison is most instructive. So here is Old Hall number 57. Um, the most obvious difference between the Old Hall tradition and that of Venecreata Spiritus is the additional octave displacement in the lower voice. So whilst the Old Hall tradition begins on a unison and cadences on an octave, uh, Venecreata always begins and cadences on the octave. Between these points, the voices follow a similar contour, generally taking the prescribed pictures of a discanting voice, uh, mainly moving in parallel motion, often note against note, and with a large number of consecutive imperfect consonances, but an octave lower than we might expect. Whilst the lowest voice of Venecreata does seem to be pitched lower than the examples from Old Hall, it is still within the bounds of theoretical possibility, at least as described by uh, Pseudo Chilston, though I don't know of any example which explores the lower range for quite this long. Uh, the grammatical function of this voice seems extremely unusual too. Um, at every important cadence, it forms an octave with the upper voice, but is doubled at the unison by the tenor. This forms some rather bizarre uh, cadential structures, which betray a composer apparently torn between two different ways of structuring the texture. The tenor of this mass clearly is a tenor in the usual grammatical sense, and never takes the fifth of the cadence, as in the old hall examples. But the nominal contratenor clearly fails to behave as at least I would expect a contratenor to behave, and it never takes the fifth above, uh, above the tenor at any cadence in the entire piece. In most cases, um, the contratenor has actually been taking the fifth in the beat before the cadence, uh, but an octave lower. And this almost always gives the contratenor a somewhat uncomfortable drop of a fourth in these situations, uh, rather than having the tenor sink extremely low or the contratenor leap up by an octave, which would seem the most obvious contrapuntal solution. Perhaps this calls to mind similar moments in the handling of some of the textures in old hall movements which blend discant and chanson styles, uh, where some cadences do seem to be reached with no fifths. Overall, this work seems rather experimental, uh, and I keep open the possibility that it's simply not very good. Um, <laughs> however, I have two separate hypotheses which may help to explain the unusual texture. Uh, one is that, as Robert Snow tentatively postulated in his study of Strahov, this work is based uh, on a now lost polyphonic model. Um, this model perhaps was a discount setting the chant in the upper voices and the same voice designation as we find in this mass. This would maybe explain why the nominal contratenor begins in a note against note style and then seems to become more mobile and more like a contratenor as each movement goes on. Um, when maybe it's not paraphrasing so much pre-existent material. Uh, and why the role of the two lower voices is seemingly so confused, they seem to get in each other's way quite a lot. The second option is that this work is itself an adaptation of discount technique, um, 
combined with chanson style as with several items in old hall since such a work would probably have been in score notation originally it's copying out in a semi semi literal manner uh, could explain the rather unusual placement of each voice part in the strahov copy in either case uh, I think this is perhaps more evidence that this has an English origin, uh, though it's clearly written by a composer heavily influenced by continental practice. As noted above, uh, the other two mass cycles with contratenors cleft below the tenor are clearly not from the same tradition. A close comparison seems to tell much about composerly intention in the two works. Nobilis et pulchra, though cleft with a contratenor below the tenor, opens with the contratenor as the middle voice in the texture. It has previously been described as a mass with a middle voice contratenor and as one of the earliest of Fry's works uh, in Brian Trow's uh, Grove article on Fry. My opinion here differs in both respects. The plain chant on which this work is based is actually a relatively low line chant and begins at the lowest point of its range, precisely the same range as Gwen Malignus Spiritus, in fact. The contratenor begins as the middle voice and, just as with both examples above, the contratenor only reaches its this time expected position at the foot of the texture as the chant begins its first ascent towards the upper reaches of its range. For examples, in bar 13 to 21, the Kyrie. In this regard, it behaves identically with Quem Malignus Spiritus or Fuit Homo, uh, though with opposite concern, since the intention seems to be to keep the third voice at the foot of the texture as far as as the cantus firmus will allow, with the mid-range of the chant allowing the contratenor to drop below the tenor rather than allowing the contratenor to keep above it. Um, so I should probably say third voice as we're talking about second cantuses in the previous two examples. One of the most interesting elements of this work is the grammatical function of the contratenor. If we switch our attention to the moment uh, when the chant reaches its absolute highest point, we see some very interesting features. At this point in the Gloria at bar 93, uh, we have the contratenor now firmly at the foot of the texture, taking the grammatical role of the tenor at the cadence. As Bent has pointed out to me before, Fry seems to do this relatively frequently. Indeed, it's a clear feature of his two masses with lower cleft contratenor, but is seemingly absent in the sine nomine mass attributed to him by Curtin. Of course, since this sine nomine mass keeps stratified voice ranges and has no pre-existent material. Fry is seemingly not presented with the opportunity to do this in this mass, whereas he is presented with ample opportunity whenever he has uh, this sort of textual configuration. <coughs> By contrast, the sine nomine I have recently tentatively attributed to Fry is the only surviving English example with lower cleft contratenor. Um, that is example of a sine nomine with, with a lower cleft contratenor. Um, and would surely, if it is indeed by Fry, have had moments of the contratenor taking on tenor function. Uh, the profile of the surviving voices is suggestive of this, but sadly not enough of it survives to find any example to prove it. Summa Trinitati makes an illuminating comparison with Nobilis et Pulchra. Both have the same distance between clefts, even if they differ slightly in detail, but on face value seem to have quite different textual property, uh, textural properties rather. As Kirkman has shown, the contratenor of this mass remains below the tenor for almost the entire work. Again, a consideration of its chant basis explains why. This chant is much higher in range than the select pulchra and opens relatively high in that range. Just as we, with each of the other examples considered above, the contratenor drops below the tenor when the tenor is particularly high. In this case, this is 94% of the time. Importantly, as Ben has noted, the contratenor again sometimes takes the role of the tenor at the cadence whenever pretty much whenever allowed to by the ranges of each part. Whilst it seems clear that English masses based on cantus fermi in this period are only as stratified as their cantus fermi allow, there do seem to be two clear paradigms based on whether the third voice is nominally the lower or the middle voice. The latter option seems to be a later development, as Kirkman has noted, and, and usually one for which the only attributed examples are found in works by Fry. This development also seems to account for those works in which the contratenor occasionally supplants tenor function. This brings to mind Anonymous Eleven's famous contention that insofar as the contratenor goes beneath the tenor, it is called the tenor. When it was believed that this formulation was found in a source of the 14th century, this seemed patently wrong. Now that it's believed to date from the late 15th century, it's possible that the theorist was describing a new practice in which the contratenor does very occasionally supplant the role of the tenor when underneath it. Uh, the generality with which he makes this statement does still seem extremely questionable, nevertheless. Just to finish with a brief consideration of the sine nomine masses. 
if contratenor function is so constrained by Cantor's firmus choice, then it must be questioned, I should probably say range there rather than function, it must be questioned whether the sine nominee repertory displays a different approach to texture. This certainly seems to be the case as the majority demonstrate a comparatively stratified texture and include most of Kirkman's most highly stratified examples. Most interestingly, only three mid-century sine nomine masses, those by Beddingham, Stanley and Tick, appear to avoid a generally stratified texture. Kirkman has already noted that Tick's sine nomine has a contratenor that is somewhat less altus, but still spends more than half of its time above the tenor. Most interestingly, he's also noted that whilst it often takes the fifth at cadences, uh, it almost never does so by using the octave leap cadence. When assuming the fifth would require this, it instead takes the role of one of the two grammatical voices, sometimes supplanting the upper voice and sometimes the tenor. Both the Stanley and Beddingham examples uh, respect the grammatical dyad throughout, uh, though the Beddingham example has a particularly low contratenor which sits at the foot of the texture more than half of the time. So, what to make of these cycles? They could simply be seen as a step towards the lower cleft contratenor, of course. However, they seem to be quite early, since two of them were copied in continental sources in the early 1450s. I wonder if this might instead be indicative of continental influence on the composers in question, since all have, with varying degrees of confidence, uh, been linked to continental employment. We now know that Tick, thought by Strom to have been active in Bruges, was living and working in Seville later in the century whilst Beddingham and Stanley have been linked uh, to Italy by Rebecca Gerber. Of course, Beddingham is the only English composer of this period to set a mass based on a continental song. If this should be seen as evidence of continental influence of some kind, should the lower cleft contratenor itself be seen so, especially as it's so rare at this period? If so, this could offer more evidence for the presence of Fry on the continent, <coughs> especially given the, given the increasing number of works potentially by him found in continental lands, especially around Burgundy. It's probably too early to say this, uh, but it's perhaps fertile ground for further research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Very, uh, Excuse me, sorry, the light is in my eyes. Okay. Very Not thorough and illuminating was what I was about to say. Uh, some questions, please. Anybody? Yes? Thank you. Thanks very much, James. It's um, giving full and very rich and interesting new stuff. I didn't know you were going to say this. <laughs> um, there's a number of things I want to say about the minutes, what they are, really. Mm -hmm. One of them is about the country tenors and the yeah. tenor function thing. As you were talking, I was thinking of all of those masses in the Yes. To, um, to follow the standard function even when you know, the need for movement. Oh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Against what you yeah. Mean, absolutely. You know, they, they always struggle to get into a position whereby the tenor and the champs can have the octave. Yeah, you have it, have it going a lower, enormous. a lower octave below yeah. that octave, but you know, quite often you get them lurching to enormous. Distance. Yes, you have sort of a two octave range in two bars, don't you? Yeah, between. Maybe it's about five octave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing that. Um, me. Uh, you mentioned Diane Grisseur as being, mm. and, and actually when you, when you pointed that out, you said, you know, and I wrote that article about Diane Grisseur and putting it into context, yeah. it's um, all of the pieces that kind of seemed like it in its behaviour mm. towards its pigs, and like, towards its model, if that's not too kind of term for it, um, do the same kind of thing, you yeah. know, the same kind of, they relate in similar ways to the pigs. Mm. And I think they did behave on some quite similar mm. to yeah, Yes, yeah. You know, they, they, they seem to be at peace. Mm. It's not just about how they respond to, you know, that's what they can see other things to do. And just, I guess, my last point, and then I'll shut up for a bit. Um, they too carry a mass, which I still thought of. Again, I've dredged out of the recesses of my mind recently for various reasons. I wonder if. At some point, uh, we might find what that is based on. Because that's mm. like, I suppose, we have the second order and some of the, you know, maybe the senior number and that's where the, the benefit of us kind of thing. Yeah. Whether that's, um, I'm sure it's based on something here. Yeah, I, I had a look, had a look a, at I've that. Had, I've had a sort of sense, you know, at least, you know, we have a sort of stab at one. You know, but it's difficult to get something that's paradigmatic enough. 
Yeah, I, I had a look at that recently myself, and I, I was struck by the fact that sort of when when the, the at the start of the second repetition of the of the presumably some sort of plain chant basis in there, um, the discounter opens almost identically for about four or five bars in quite long note ranges. So I, I'm I'm starting to wonder whether we have some sort of weird migrant cantus firmus in that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've not found anything well, that fits it closely that enough. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, if you can find that, I'd certainly buy you a few of it. I don't know, but just from your cadences, it looked as if that contratenor part would be an alternative tenor. Mm, the, I think that the, 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 the contratenor and tenor parts have exactly the same function, mm. uh, and it, it looks like they're about to do the same thing and there's a realization it will cause consecutive octaves and then they sort of so yeah it, 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 it seems as though two parts are performing the same function and i'm not quite sure why that is so do you think it might just be simply well, omit one of them completely conflated yeah now that might make sense although i suppose I'm, I'm not sure why why there'd be such a vast difference in in the clef between the mm. two. I suppose a C2 clef for a tenor part seems a little high, but maybe that's not too problematic. Mm. It's mm. something worth thinking about, certainly. Right, next. I don't have anything to add. I just want to congratulate you on, on putting this together so, so well. I think oh, you've made a wonderful job of blending the range <laughs> issues and the function issues and calibrated it extremely nicely. It's very good oh, thank you. Do it in relation to the well oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I think that it's it's interesting to see how the composers work within that. I mean, there's obviously a big sort of tension field there where you have the what what they have to do because of the cantus firmus, what they want to do because of the grammar, uh, and equally what they're trying to do to avoid other contrapuntal fun um, issues. Um, so I, I think it, yeah, if you can get an idea of how they balance those different pri priorities, it's probably will probably be, be useful. I've not, not really done enough work on it yet. I'd hope to have a little more before this. But. Just one, uh, one thing I wonder whether you've looked at it in the Fry cases that mm. we discussed earlier. Um, to what extent he had to, Fry had to mm. do that because of what the chart was doing. Of course, he could always have um, segmented the chart. Yes. He didn't have to. But to what extent are it, those places where the contratenor takes the tenor function away from the tenor due to... Uh, as, as far as I can see, it seems to be more about him having the opportunity to do it rather than the necessity. Um, because if you compare the exact same moments in the chant in each movement, um, he, yeah, he, he sort of does them in different ways. So you have, yeah, he, he says, okay, fine, we'll keep, keep it, keep function normal here, which he does in the Kyrie. You then hit the Gloria and it does the opposite. And I think so he could have the same exactly the same point in the chant. Mm -hmm. And I think he could take it either way in either case. It just seems to be something he likes doing, um, which is interesting in itself. So in effect, he's exploiting uh, composition mm. rather than enforcement. Yes, I, I think I think I'd say that. Yeah. Mm. That's all the piece with the chart. Actually. Yeah. No. Very true. Very true. Mm. I think I think a really close comparison between those two pieces is the Yeah, no, so I, I agree. Really, you know, not just you know, obviously the piece comes along and it's really made of which I like. But so, you know, just the way that they behave from very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I think that the, the, the structuring of the contratenor is completely different in both yeah. of them. I think uh, I think Nobilis yeah, Pulchra really is good. is much more like a second cantus, but a really low one. Um, but again, I'm not sure how much difference that actually makes to the piece as a whole. I, I need to get into it a bit more. Just time for just one last quick question. And something else. Very good. Well, once again, thank you thank so you. much, James. Thank you. Are you back on the uh, mat, Peter? <laughs> Thank you.
Which presentation is yours? Thank you. Well, that's what it is. It is. Close that. That's yes. This is the second set of emails. There's one set. If you minimize right function, send us off on one there, Scott. That's function and F11. Yeah. This one. Yes, no, 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 don't do that. Always oh, the entire screen. Why? Because when you full screen it, it doesn't show that, it just shows the PowerPoint. Yeah, that's right. So we just have to. Yeah, so entire screen. Just hide that and just. James, has your has everybody got a contact? <laughs> Sorry? I know, it's terrible. I've regressed. I've regressed. Yes. <laughs> Thought it's time I taught myself Sebadius. All right. <laughs> I've just, just about enough light if I stand here. Ah, no, it's all right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next paper is from Professor Peter Wright, who is Emeritus Professor of Music at Nottingham University. Peter Wright was born in Vienna and educated in the UK. He took BA and BMUS in composition at Oxford University, where he was awarded the John Noel Osgood Memorial Prize in musical composition. He then worked in London as a freelance writer, composer and teacher before resuming full-time study, MA and PhD at the University of Nottingham. Following an appointment at the University of Exeter in 1987, he returned to Nottingham in 1988, where he was promoted to a personal chair in 2006. His main research interests lie in English and continental music of the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance, with a particular focus on source study. Central to his work are the Trent Codices, the largest surviving collection of early and mid 15th century polyphony, on which he has published a monograph, and as well as numerous articles. And he has also edited a set of international conference proceedings, I Codice Musicali Trentini, from 1996. He has contributed to many journals, including Early Music History, Plain Song and Medieval Music, and Music and Letters and he was awarded the Wester Prize for the last me mentioned. He has also published collections of essays, as well as two editions of 15th century mass music for the British Academy series, Early English Church Music. In addition to his many other publications, he has been director of a major research project, the music, an music anthology of Hermann Pötzlinger, circa 1415 to 69, which was funded by the AHRC and focused on one of the central sources of late medieval European polyphony, the so-called St. Emram Codex. He and his collaborator on the project, Ian Rumbled, co-authored the commentary to a new facsimile of the Codex and a monograph, Hermann Pötzingler's music book, I nearly said music book, <laughs> <laughs> music book, the St. Emram Codex and its, con and its context, Boydell. 2009, which was awarded the 2010 C.B. Oldman Prize. Professor Wright has served on the Council of the Royal Musical Association and the Committee for, the Early, for Early English Church Music, of which he is currently chair. In 2012, he held a British Academy Senior Research Fellowship and was a visiting fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. And today, he's going to address us with a question, a new attribution to Dunstable. Thank you, Peter. Oh, thank you very much. I feel quite embarrassed at your very generous allocation of time to my introduction. Thank you. Item 10 in my recent edition of early 15th century mass music, EECM 55, is a credo preserved anonymously in the Aosta Codex and with the designation Anglicanus or Anglicanum 
in Trent 92, where it is copied twice, once in each of the two independent parts of the manuscript. This work has attracted almost no attention in the literature, which is hardly surprising given that until recently it had never been published. Yet there can be no doubting its high quality. Beautifully crafted, it is a composition full of melodic charm and rhythmic energy, striking for its ingenious syncopations. The compiler of Trent 92 appears himself to have been impressed, since he describes the work as bonum in his index to the manuscript. Though it has to be said that some of the other works to which the, uh, this descriptor is applied are, are somewhat less distinguished. In my commentary to the Credo Anglicanus, as I shall refer to this work, I noticed a stylistic similarity to some pieces in Old Hall, as well as Dunstable's early mass music, but decided to let matters rest there. In the process of bringing a large, complex, and long overdue edition to completion, I was in no position to pursue these observations any further. But when I finally had the chance to do so, it became apparent that while there were indeed similarities between the Credo Anglicanus and several works in Old Hall, it was with Dunstable's early mass music and one work in particular that this composition's real affinity lay. The work in question is the Credo numbered eight in the collected edition, which Bukowska considered to be part of a Gloria Credo pair. And there's the list of contents extrapolated from the, or the first page of the list of contents extrapolated from his edition. In the 1970 revised edition, this pairing was retained in the contents pages, but rejected by the revisers in the commentary on the grounds that it was based on scribal authority alone and was not supported by internal characteristics. They also rejected Bukowski's pairing of JD9 and the anonymous JD10 and on the same grounds, while accepting that there was nothing in the style of JD10 to contradict his assumption that this setting is by Dunstable. While the revisor's rejection of the pairing of JD9 and 10 makes good sense, their uncoupling of JD7 and 8 seems to me to be open to question, although this is not a discussion for today. For present purposes, suffice it to say, that we have one credo setting with an ascription to Dunstable that is definitely independent, namely JD5, and another JD8 that may or may not be. Now you have two handouts in front of you, which are mainly for reference, as you will need to follow the, the PowerPoint. Um, one is an adaptation of my ECM edition uh, of the Credo Anglicanus. I've already been uh, charged with uh, regression there by adopting uh, reduced note values. Um, uh, so I've used quartered note values, um, of course, against all the principles of ECM and many other um, uh, uh, distinguished uh, series. Um, but, but for ease of comparison, um, while the, um, the other is an ad adaptation of the Musica Britannica edition of JD8. Now, this latter work has two sources, uh, Bologna Q15 and Trent 92.1, neither of which is without problems, but although, uh, J uh, although Trent 92.1, that's part one, is the later and less careful copy, it seems in some ways, part J Meg, the more authentic. As in the Credo Anglicanus, for example, Trent 92.1 does not furnish the contratenor with a staff signature, and it is this version rather than the B-flat signature of Q15 that I've chosen to follow here. If we set these two works alongside each other, certain basic common features are immediately apparent. Obviously, the setting for three voices, the subdivision of each section into three, se uh, sorry, each setting into three sections, as shown on the overhead. Um, each with its own mensuration, the same divisional points in the text, see them there, and the text telescoping in the upper voices, a subject to which we shall return. On closer inspection, other resemblances emerge. The opening sections, for instance, though written in different mensurations, are identical in length, 132 semibriefs, four times 33, the number of Christ's years on earth. This could be coincidence, yet it appears that JD8 is one of just two works ascribed to Dunstable that contains a section this length. 
The settings of the Amen are also identical in length, seven breves, while the middle sections, each notated in C dot, are almost identical. Both works, moreover, have the same clefts and voice ranges, a configuration found in no other composition ascribed to Dunstable. Turning to musical details, many common features are to be found, several of them relating to the start or finish of a section. Both settings begin with the discantus and tenor in unison and the contratenor entry delayed, while the start of the final section of the Credo Anglicanus also recalls, recalls the opening of JD8. Each opening section, moreover, concludes with a descending figure in the discantus and a chord containing a third, still something of a rarity in English music of the period and a feature of only a handful of Dunstable's <coughs> works. And there is even a brief resemblance between the openings of the two middle sections. Finally, the settings of the Amen, uh, which as I've already pointed out are the same length, are strikingly similar in terms of their compactness, rhythmic energy, and finely wrought counterpoint. Both works are marked by a strong rhythmic style, more regularly punctuated by rests than the later music, and characterized by extensive use of syncopation. This device occurs in isolation and in chains. So there are some examples from the Credo Anglicanus and from JD8. And in both settings, it involves the embedding of triple time pat patterns within duple meter. So pom, pa pom, pa pom, pa pom. In the central section of the Credo Anglicanus, the syncopation is reminiscent of Dunstable's Canonic Gloria, a work it's all too easy to uh, forget about. <laughs> No less striking than the rhythmic similarities between the, the Credo Anglicanus and JD8 are the close melodic resemblances, particularly in the pervasive use, sometimes in sequence, of a figure comprising a falling second followed by a falling third, here referred to as figure eight, uh, X and indicated by uh, a red arrow. It's used almost uh, uh, obsessively um, in, both, in both works. Um, so there are a few examples from the Credo Anglicanus and a few from uh, JD8. Both works employ <laughs> similar cadences. And both have almost exactly the same level of dissonance. Among the many features that these two works have in common, it is their texting that is arguably the most striking since they have the very same arrangement. To appreciate the significance of this, we need to consider the 15th century practice of telescoping. This practice, whereby the text is shared between voices, is a regular feature of English credos from the time of Old Hall until the middle of the 15th century. Gareth Curtis, who in his 1979 thesis was the first to examine telescoping systematically for the English repertory, identified two basic methods. The first, which he called two sections at telescoping, entailed splitting the text into two segments and setting them simultaneously. The second, and by far the more common method, which he called alternate phrase telescoping, involved the simultaneous treatment of phrases or groups of phrases. Curtis noted that this latter method gave rise to almost as many patterns as there are pieces, an observation strongly confirmed by my own more recent work on crater settings in fragmentary sources. Most of these settings show evidence of telescoping and no two of them share the same pattern or even a similar one. Curtis identified certain basic principles underlying the practice of telescoping, four of which are particularly relevant here. One, the entire text is set. Two, normally only the discantus and mobile contratenor parts are involved. Three, Phrases allotted to a given part occur in the correct order. And four, at the end of the internal section of a work, text is presented complete up to that point. 
All four principles are strictly adhered to in the Credo Anglicanus and JD8. Both the discantus and contra tenor set the words patrim omnipotentum, marked in red here, uh, as well as the amen at the end, but are otherwise textually independent. So the two parts, discantus shown in yellow, contra tenor in green. Each setting not only has the same pattern of alternate phrase telescoping with the same allocation by voice part, but subdivides the text at the same points in the upper voices at the end of the first and second sections. So that takes us to the end of section one and then sections two and three. Since it is very unusual, uh, as we've seen for, or as I've noted, for two credo settings to share an identical or even near identical pattern of telescoping, the fact that JD8 and the Credo Anglicanus adopt precisely the same pattern would seem significant. JD8 appears to be the only credo ascribed to Dunstable that follows this pattern, but appearances can be deceptive. When the revised edition of the complete works was published, the only known source for JD5, remember that's the um, independent setting in that first group of pieces, the only known source for JD5 was Aosta. There the entire text is assigned to the discantus, while both the lower voices are untexted. Since similar arrangements are found in Old Hall and elsewhere, there was no reason to question this one. A few years ago, however, an English fragment came to light in Philadelphia that preserves most of the discantus of JD5. From what survives in this fragment, it is clear that JD5 must have had a telescoped arrangement identical to that found in both JD8 and the Credo Anglicanus, but with the sectional divisions occurring at different points in the text, and that the arrangement found in Iosta must therefore be a continental adaptation. Um, so there you've got Iosta on the upper stave, Philadelphia, what survives of it, um, on the lower stave. So you can see where you've got Visibilium Omnium uh, in Iosta, you've got Factorum Chaley, and so on in uh, Philadelphia. So we haven't time to dwell on this, but we can come back to it if we want to. So what you have in Philadelphia uh, corresponds basically to the yellow bits. Thus, JD5, JD8, and the Credo Anglicanus may be seen as sharing a pattern of telescoping that is apparently unique to them. A further significant difference between the two sources of JD5 lies in their notation, since the middle section of the work is notated in C dot in the Philadelphia fragment, but has been renotated in cut circle in Aosta, with the note values at the next level up. JD5 and JD8 thus have the same menstrual scheme, a fact that the continental renotation obscures. These works and the canonic Gloria published by Margaret Bent in 1996 are the only ones ascribed to Dunstable that have self-contained sections in C and C dot, both of which mensurations are also present in the Credo Anglicanus. The close connections between these three credo settings are reinforced by their source locations. Thus, in Trent 92, part one, the Credo Anglicanus and JD8 appear within a cluster of five English works, including motets by Forrest and Dunstable, the latter transmitted anonymously here, and the Gloria scribally paired with JD8. Within this cluster, then, we have three works in a row to uh, ascribe to Dunstable either in this source or a concordant one, preceded by a fourth work that may also be his. Interestingly, both the Credo Anglicanus and JD8 are laid out in identical fashion in Trent 92.1, with the page break occurring at the end of the second section. Uh, so there's uh, the first opening of the Credo Anglicanus with sections one and two, 
the final opening, uh, the last section box there, uh, and then uh, JD8 uh, following the same pattern. This simply reflects the fact that both works have the same overall structure and are of similar length. But the overspill of the Credo Anglicanus onto a second opening uh, uh, meant that there was insufficient space for JD8 to be accommodated within this opening. This raises the possibility that the short Gloria uh, that I've boxed there, which occupies most of this opening and is contained within it, may be a later addition to the gathering, a hypothesis that the pattern of ink shades within the gathering appears to support. If this hypothesis is correct, then it means that two intimately related credos, the Credo Anglicanus and JD8, were at one stage adjacent. Two further features of Trent 92.1 are worth noting here. The first is that the use, that is the use of a darker ink for the ascription at the head of the Credo Anglicanus, uh, sorry, uh, a darker ink than for the piece itself, probably indicating that this was a later edition. The second feature, uh, and this brings us close to an issue that um, James was, was uh, touching on, um, is the absence of contratenor label from both openings of JD8 and from the first opening of the Credo Anglicanus, suggesting that this voice may originally have been viewed as a low second cantus part, as has been proposed by Margaret Bent for JD8. Uh, the designation of the contratenor on the second opening uh, I don't know if you can make it out there, but where the red arrow is, um, uh, slightly oddly positioned there. Um, this designation uh, was probably just force of continental scribal habit. Arster, like Trent 92.1, is well known for its transmission of a large quantity of English music. Such is the concentration of this repertory within just a few gatherings that they have become known collectively as the English Lair. In one of these gatherings, JD5 and the Credo Anglicanus are adjacent and presented in that order. The first page of the gathering is occupied by the closing section of a continental work. <coughs> um, begun in the, sorry, a continental work begun in the preceding gathering. But the rest of the gathering is occupied by five English works, two with ascriptions to Dunstable. As in Trent 92.1, it would be difficult to find a manuscript context more encouraging of the idea that an, an anonymous work is by him. As with any unascribed work, one has to ask why the Credo Anglicanus is transmitted anonymously. It may simply be that the scribe's exemplar lacked an ascription, or at least a credible one. Or it could be that an ascription was removed when the manuscript was trimmed for binding a distinct possibility given the proximity of the top stave of the piece to the edge of the page. But a further possibility is that the ascription appended to the previous item in the manuscript, namely JD5, was also intended to apply to the Credo Anglicanus. There are several instances in Auster, each involving the work of the same scribe, of a single ascription applying to two or more successive items. They include Powers' Mass Alma Redemptoris Mater, where the four surviving sections appear as a unit, but with the name Leonel above the Gloria alone. Two movements of Dunstable's Mass da Gaudiorum Premier, and a Gloria Credo pair, also by Dunstable. In each case, the musical connections between related items, whether involving a Cantus Firmus or other kinds of common musical material are self-evident, and it may have been for this reason that the scribe considered it unnecessary to repeat the ascription. But if this was his practice with items that together constitute a larger musical entity, why should it not apply where two or more items of the same type appear together? Perhaps it is time to broaden our definition of the term pairing. In conclusion, I suggest that the close kinship between the Credo Anglicanus and JD8 in terms of their style, structure, texting, and transmission, confers, confers a kind of twin status upon these works, and that their affinity both with one another and with JD5 makes the case for attributing the Credo Anglicanus to the greatest English composer of the period, an especially compelling one. We still know too little about Dunstable's biography and the chronology of his music to be able to date most of his works other than very approximately. 
The presence of JD8 in a layer of Bologna Q15, copied during the first half of the 1420s, suggests that the Credo Anglicanus and JD5 had also been composed by then. But whether these works belong to the early 1420s or the 1410s is impossible to say with any certainty. Either way, they would appear to have been composed around the same time. It would be difficult, of course, to rule out the possibility that the Credo Anglicanus is the work of a skilled imitator of Dunstable. The most that can be said it is, is that it is every bit the equal of its two bedfellows. ECM intends in due course to publish a new edition of Dunstable. If this edition ever sees the light of day, then my personal hope is that this fine Credo Anglicanus or Patrim Bonum will find a home there. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an elegant piece of detective work. Very, very interesting. Some questions? Bravo. <laughs> very, very persuasive. Um, obviously, I'm going to have to go and uh, look at a lot of other things and see what else uh, could be brought into this. Um, I, but I didn't quite understand to what extent you've looked at um, other English credos uh, outside Dunstable. When you say that this is the only case this happens, well, comparisons are all within the, the, the entire, uh, well, particularly with the texting, the entire yes. repertory, repert repert yes, yes. But, uh, Mm. Yes, I mean, you know, it's interesting. You just, you just, you take that opening figure, dum da da dum of of of, of, of JD eight, and, and of course it's got that that archetypal melodic figure. But actually, and you you think, well, there must be dozens of pieces that begin like this. I I, um, I I've yet to. Well, I don't think there's a single one in Old Hall. For example, just to take no, no, to to take that you know example, and but 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 one of the interesting things is JD seven begins with uh, you know that rhythm, um, the work with which it's uh, questionably paired. Yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is mm. when you give a percentage of dissonance, how do you how do you calculate dissonance? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I thought someone would ask me that. Those um, <laughs> already. Um, yes. Uh, well, this is this is at the minimum level. At the minimum level, so quite simultaneous, quite, 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 quite yes, yes, without, it, without mm. any consideration of lateral displacements and no, not no, that's that's to, that's to, that's to come, that's yeah, yeah. that's so as far as I've gone, of course, of that kind of syncopation, yes, which in my book, doesn't yes, count as dissonance. yes, mm. yeah, mm. okay, no, no, point taken, David, Peter, you know my question, but I've got to voice it anyway, which is how you tell the difference between one composer composing the same piece twice and another composer modeling a piece. I know, a, I know. Bittering, uh, bittering. Uh, we've yeah, had yeah. This yeah, of course, yes. of course. But as you, I mean, I, I think you took the view that the, um, the anonymous piece was not as good as the bittering, whereas here I yeah, think you've got yeah. something that's well, I don't know what others will. Th I'd be interested to know. You know, if you take those handouts away, I'm very receptive to thoughts. But it seems to me that it's a damn good piece. Um, yeah. I'm still troubled though with yeah. the thought of one composer mm -hmm. writing the same piece twice. Mm -hmm. um, well, absolutely on the same plan. Um, it, it doesn't. I, I can't think of examples. Mm -hmm. So there must be, there must be, Chicone, yes, more than, more than two, yes. Okay, talk about that later. Um, okay. Chicone. I think you had a question. Yeah, well, both of my questions have already been asked. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, Megan, David. Oh, please. Um, and I had this question one way and then you answered it for us, but I was, I was wondering, um, whether you had any ideas why it wasn't attributed to Dunstable in Trent, because the other um, piece is. Well, it's quite a different version of mm -hmm. the piece with a different transmission. Um, the, 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 the two versions in Trent, were you, were, were you referring yes, to? No. The, the one that I didn't refer to? Yeah. Oh, well, because oh, right, well, it's attributed mm. as Anglicanus and not. Or, I mean, it's really, It's uh, Anglicanum at the head of the piece, right, and in right. the index, it's Anglicanus. Right, but um, there are, but there's another piece by Dunstable that has, I mean, there are, 
Sorry, I'm, I'm not no, quite not. following the question. Um, no, I was wondering why either of them weren't attributed to Dunstable. Either of the translations. Well, the uh, I mean, it's, it's a very fair question. The, the second of the Trent ninety two mm. copies, which I didn't I deliberately didn't talk about because if I've got this right, it's a direct copy from Arster. Um, so uh, the absence of the ascription. Uh, in Arsenal would ex would help oh, explain the absence of it from that second trend copy. If that answers your question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Just James. Want, just wanted to agree with your point really about the uh, the outlining of that melodic opening, which we all mm. think of as sort of mm. the quintessential English opening. Mm. Uh, which is the yeah, I, I would quite agree that it, it's pretty much ubiquitous in the mid century. But mm. There, it's just not there as much. Mm to begin with, sort of all mm. of the examples that I can think of are, mm. are from sort of 1440 mm. onwards, mm. at which point it just saturates everything, mm. but mm. certainly before then, I think. Mm. Probably, right? I think it's probably time that we wrapped up this session. Mm. Once again, it remains for me to thank you, Peter, very warmly. Thank you. For a stimulating mm. paper and very many good questions. So thank you again. Next on the menu. I don't even remember.